Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, and all the ships at sea. I am Joe Hollywood. Let's go to the press. Imaginos Pete joins us here. How's it going? Imaginos Pete, yeah. Doing just fine. I thought we were going with Mid-Atlantic. Oh, okay. I don't know. Hello, and I am am Chuck Chuck Dalton. (laughs) Chuck Dalton. Chuck Dalton. Hunky Hollywood heartthrub. That's right. Heartthrob. Chunk Dalton makes a lady swoon. That's right. All right. Ow, ow. We'll explain that in a little bit. But um, <laughs> I'm excited about today's episode. This gets back to the reasons why we started doing this podcast in the first place. To dig up dirt, to look into scandals, murders, the underbelly of Hollywood. Um, and we are getting right into that today. The you know, the feel good stuff. Season. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, what, what the topic today is basically what Hollywood is known for since the beginning when, uh, you know, like the way the, that movie Babylon referred to it, it was a, just a, a pit of sex and, and, uh, just, uh, unbridled ecstasy and, and, uh, and it caused things like the Hayes Code and and even Washington, D.C. to take notice and try to crack down on the debauchery in Hollywood. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about are the sex scandals, the, the crimes that revolve around sex in uh, Hollywood in the early days and uh, – and uh, more modern times. You know you're in trouble when Sodom and Gomorrah are going, this is a bit much. Guys. Yeah, take it take it down <laughs> a notch, a guys. Much. Come on. <laughs> and, you know, you got to wonder if, if Washington didn't step in and kind of quash things, how how far would it have gone? Yeah. Well, you know, like we talked about before, that J. Edgar Hoover and and the FBI, he, he, he did his part in trying to shape Hollywood. So, yeah. Yeah. And so the result was, which I think is sort of interesting, is – the result was when the Hayes Code got passed and, and D.C. got involved that the filmmakers had to get creative about implying sex and hinting at sex, which personally I think made for better and more interesting movies, you yeah. know? Like, you know, there's kind of a cliche where man and woman would meet on screen and then there's an edit where a train is going into a tunnel, you know? <laughs> and I get a kick out of stuff like that. Sure. And the folks in D.C. are like, what? That's That seems okay to me. And so they had to create some innuendo and hint at things, which made things really, really interesting. Um, now, the first topic I wanted to talk about is something I wanted to touch on on our very first episode. I almost... Kind of wish I would have brought this up on our very first episode because this, most people agree that this scandal was the very first major Hollywood sex scandal. This is the one that uh, all others uh, strove to uh, be, to emulate. Uh, not that anyone would want to be in this situation, but I am talking about Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle. Don't call him Fatty to his face. He didn't like that. <laughs> But uh, I imagine a lot of people would. <laughs> and born in, uh, I believe it was 1898, he was a silent film star, director, writer. Uh, he mentored the likes of Charlie Chaplin, Bob Hope, introduced the world to Buster Keaton. This guy was one of the most influential silent film stars uh, of the time. But strangely, and I don't know if you guys can agree with me on this, as, as a kid growing up and having sort of a passing knowledge of Laurel and Hardy and Charlie Chaplin and some of the early silent film stars, I had never heard of Fatty Arbuckle as a kid. His stuff wasn't being played on Channel 50 on Saturday afternoon or Sunday same, afternoon. Same here. So I think because of the scandal, I think uh, a lot of his films just weren't being shown, weren't being screened, and uh, his his name could have been lost a time if not for this scandal, which as people like us keep bringing his name up. I think the only up. time, the first time I ever heard about him was as a Simpsons reference by George, uh, by Mr. Burns, Montgomery, because uh-huh. he's the old guy who, who references yeah, yeah. some movie. Or... You remember the line? 
No, no. Oh. But that's the only thing. When you say Fatty Arbuckle, I was like, who the heck is Fatty Arbuckle? But he's the funniest thing since Fatty Arbuckle. Yeah, but it, it would take a Simpsons writer who probably went to Harvard <laughs> who would probably do their research on that. That's right. Uh, here's some uh, milestones in his career. In 1920, he signed a contract with Paramount Studios worth $1 million per year. Now, that's at $1920. Oh. I can't even imagine what that contract would be worth oh. in uh, 2023. We won't have to imagine. While you're Dude, talking, I'm going to do Bust out the calculator and <laughs> see what $1 million is worth uh, 100 years later. Approximately $14 million, Nick. Uh, let's see how close he is. That's interesting. Um, also, while you're, while you're punching in the numbers, the first on-screen pie throw uh, may have been in a 1913 film starring Fatty Arbuckle. So uh, he gave birth to the legendary pie fights that we've seen in many, many movies from that era and beyond. But at, in, in his time, he was a huge, and, and pardon the pun, the pun unintended, he was a huge, huge star. And uh, so, yeah, did you calculate it? No. Well, it would be 16990000 So just, just a shade under $17 million. Wow. So think about By that. today's money. He's I was cool. off, way off. Uh, no, 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 that's, that's you said 20... 14, didn't you? That was no, fairly that's, close. The, but Wiki's a year behind. <laughs> <laughs> Man inflation. So, <laughs> yeah, imagine the lifestyle that you would have in 1920 uh, with a million dollar per year contract. Oh, uh, my gosh. That's exactly what ever, they were going for. Yeah, that's what led you want. to this wild, lavish party. So in 1921... Arbuckle drove to San Francisco with his friends, checked into the St. Francis Hotel. I don't know if it's still standing. It would be interesting if it is. Uh, during his stay, um, the partying uh, Virginia Rapp, 30-year-old Virginia Rapp, who Fatty Arbuckle, I guess, was an acquaintance with. She may have been an extra or something. Uh, she attended the party, and she was found to be seriously ill in Arbuckle's room. And the hotel doctor was uh, summoned to the room. Uh, he determined uh, that, and I have to question this guy's license, he determined that she was drunk and prescribed her morphine uh, to deal with the, what she was going through. Uh, she did not go to the hospital right away. Uh, two days later, she was admitted to the hospital. And at the hospital, uh, one of Rep's companions told the doctor that at the party, Arbuckle had raped her. Uh, but, and, and, and there's going to be a lot more of this throughout the story, the doctor found no evidence of rape, no abrasions, no force. Uh, it, it solely came from this companion of Virginia Raps. Uh, a day later, she died in the hospital of a ruptured bladder, um, and they said that in the past she had suffered from urinary tract infections made worse by alcohol consumption, so basically, she was she was sick from alcohol consumption, but her companion was trying to pin the the rap on Arbuckle. Um, now, based on this accusation, this complaint from Rap's companion, a police a police blamed Arbuckle's large frame. He was a big, heavy guy, saying that while on top of her, he's the one who ruptured her bladder. Uh, there were rumors in the tabloids, the press, that um, Arbuckle had used ice on her to violate her. Uh, that story changed to a Coke bottle, uh, later a champagne bottle. Uh, all these things were being published in the in the papers, saying that uh, that Arbuckle had violated her. Um, witnesses who were there in the room and saw Rap in distress said that. Arbuckle indeed used ice, but to place it on the area of her abdomen where she was experiencing pain. So he was basically administering ice to try and ease her pain. That story got distorted um, yeah. through uh, <clears throat> people just trying to make the headlines. I guess there was no libel and slander back in 1920. I guess not. Hmm. Um, so this companion, such an odd name, Mambina Maud Delmont, uh, she used the opportunity to try to extort money from Arbuckle's attorneys. And, of course, the press ran with it. Uh, William Randolph Hearst, who by all accounts was just a terrible, terrible person, bragged that the scandal sold more newspapers than the sinking of the Lusitania. Uh -oh. 
So he just wanted to sell headlines or sell papers and would print anything that would help move papers. Uh, in September of 1921, Arbuckle was arrested and charged with manslaughter. During the first trial, witnesses testified against Arbuckle, um, although Dr. Beardsley said that during her stay in the hospital, Virginia Rapp never mentioned being assaulted while she was still coherent and conscious in the hospital. Uh, so you would think that would be something she would mention, yeah. but it did not come up. Uh, Arbuckle testified that he discovered Rapp in the bathroom who was vomiting violently. He picked her up, carried her into the bedroom. Uh, later, she was found going into violent convulsions. Uh, the guests picked her up, placed her in a bath bathtub, and filled it with cold water. That actually sounds like sepsis, what you're talking about, the yeah. symptoms. Uh, she was moved into another room, and the doctor was called. Uh, so all of this was presented during the trial, and the first trial, first of three, I believe, resulted in a mistrial when um, the majority of the jury uh, found him innocent, but there were a couple who just wouldn't let go. There were a couple that just said, no, he's guilty, and, and because it resulted in a hung jury, jury it resulted in a mistrial. In the second trial, Arbuckle didn't testify, which was a mistake, uh, because some juries meant that was a sign of guilt if you didn't uh, testify on your behalf. Uh, so that was a mistake in when his attorney said, uh, maybe you shouldn't testify in the second uh, trial. Uh, again, it resulted in another mistrial. In the third trial, this time Arbuckle testified, and this time Buster Keaton, who by then was a star, uh, came to the trial and testified in his defense, which seemed to help sway the jury. Uh, not only did the jury reach a unanimous not guilty verdict, the jury issued an apology to Arbuckle for having to have gone through this. That's, um, that's... for the way he had been treated by. Did the, that ever the make court. the papers? That I don't know. I'm not yeah. sure how well publicized I was that say, apology that, was. That, that... I wonder how common that is for a jury to to apologize. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Did they ever find out if the if her friend had a beef with Arbuckle? It just sounded like she was just trying to make some cash. She was trying to take advantage of the situation. And, lover, and never got line a part her of the movie. No. Now, uh, after these trials where Arbuckle had to, you know, pay these court costs and attorney fees. Uh, he was seven hundred thousand dollars in debt. Uh, was forced to sell his house, sell his cars. His career and reputation was ruined. Will Hayes of this Hayes Code banned all of his movies, blacklisted Arbuckle from appearing in films. All of this, uh, uh, just from these baseless accusations. See, now that's interesting, considering that Hearst Publications probably you know, inflamed everything. Exactly. I'm surprised his lawyers didn't go after Hearst for damages. They should he... have, but maybe that just wasn't something. I mean, this is early in the right. days of yeah. scandal rags and, and, and at that, at t Maybe at that time, Hearst, he was a pretty powerful dude. He might oh, have been sort of untouchable. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Like, no one would even bother going after him, you know. Yeah, or except, think of... for, uh, except for uh, Orson Welles, who went yeah. after him with oh, Citizen Kane. That's, yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Uh, so after all this, uh, he did continue to work. He did a little acting, did a little directing, but uh, he turned to alcohol, of course. And um, this is kind of a sad final chapter was, to his life. In June of 1933, he signed a contract with Warner Brothers to star in his first feature-length film after this scandal. Um, but that night, after parting with friends, he said, this is the best day of my life. And that night, he suffered a heart attack and died in his sleep. He was only 46 years old. Oh, wow. So imagine, imagine baseless accusations taking down quite possibly the, the, the biggest star of that era and ending his career to the point where folks like you and I um, did not know who Fatty Arbuckle is until you look up the scandal and go, right. oh, gosh, I did not know that. So I'm really surprised no one ever tried to do a biography you know someone said oh this would be a good story to try to get my oscar role on you know it's funny you should say that oh. i something i looked up a few years ago was what was on chris farley's docket had he not died at such a young age 
and that was a project, a passion project of his. Oh, he wow. wanted to play Fatty Arbuckle in a, a biopic. Oh, and you know, uh, now, I, now I think you might have mentioned that. That's right. Okay. And imagine if that would have <laughs> happened. I would have loved to have seen that. Yeah. Imagine Chris Farley as Fatty Arbuckle, man. Yeah, wow. What might have been? Who, who, who could uh, maybe portray him today, then? That's a good question. Like, who's who's kind of a heavy set actor who kind of, you know, relishes uh, that? Because you know, Chris Farley, even though he took advantage of his size to make people laugh, inside it tormented him, right? And, yeah, and that's kind of what led to his drugs and alcohol problem because he felt people were laughing at him, not with him. Right. right. Um. So who, you know, bar barring donning a fat suit to play fat right, right. buckle, I'm not sure. Who today would be willing to to do that? There are two but. people that come to mind because they have experience being heavy in their lives, mm-hmm. and they could probably do it. They could probably pull it off. I would think of Seth Rogen and Jonah mm-hmm. Hill. Yeah, oh. and, and unfortunately, both of them have lost weight, and it's it's yeah. interesting to think: would they be willing to regain weight to I play mean, those roles? Christian Bale put on weight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what he said. I was thinking maybe Christian Bale would put. Did on you ever the, see Vice? Uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, or look at Brendan Fraser with the whale. That was with the fat suit, but he also had some. Right, right. So you know they'll do it. You know, but you'd rather not have them do it. Because, but like I said, they have experience being big. It's yeah. one thing yeah. if you're, I'm. You know, it's like if Chris Pratt were to say, "I'm going to go back to being chubby." I'm like you were never that chubby, Chris. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, Parks and Rec was like your most doughy ever. Even though Rocket said that you're one sandwich away from being obese. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, sad ending uh, to a uh, you know a huge star with a, a meteoric rise and a meteoric fall and a tragic ending uh, that uh, pr- more than likely wasn't deserved. Um, now another high profile, uh, I don't know if I want to call him a victim in this situation, but uh, someone who was subject to a sex scandal, uh, who for the most part kind of emerged uh, unscathed, uh, was Errol Flynn. Now, you guys have heard the expression, in like Flynn, and apparently that expression yeah. was birthed during uh, or in the aftermath of the trial that he went through, where not only was he exonerated, it may have improved his popularity, you know? Wait, um, wait I thought the saying was in like Flint. There was a movie, <laughs> you no, know, there was a movie called In Like Flint that I believe starred uh, uh, Coburn, uh, that actor, what's his name? Greg Coburn. Uh, Coburn. James? Uh, James. James Coburn, Coburn, I think it is. Yeah, I think he was in a movie called In Like Flint. But I think that was a twist on the phrase In Like Flynn, which was referring to Errol Flynn, who could pretty much do anything and get away f- with it. And, you know, Errol Flynn just lived a life that I think most guys would be jealous of. I mean, he did what he wanted, when he wanted. And uh, as a matter of fact, he killed a guy. And uh, this is back, I think. In Joe, are you trying days. to tell us that you would like to kill a guy? Like uh, every man and, would like to kill and a guy. Get away with it. There might be some people on my list, but we're not um, adding the purge to November's election. <laughs> <laughs> it's not on. It's we're not adding that. We're not putting that on the ballot. No, no. But he he did. Uh, Errol Flynn, I think, during his days in Australia or Tasmania or something like that, uh, killed a guy. Claimed it was in self defense and uh, was exonerated in in that death. So. I mean, Dick Cheney um, shot a guy in the face. Got yes. Yes. Yeah. Had the guy apologize for his face running into the bullets. <laughs> That's power. That's right. <laughs> so here's the story. Errol Flynn, handsome leading man, one of my all-time favorite actors who was in uh, one of my all-time favorite movies, uh, Adventures of Robin Hood. Yep. Uh, he was in uh, The Seahawk and uh, Captain Blood. And other, oh, my God. The list goes on and on. Handsome swashbuckler who would always get the lady and lead the uh you know the oppressed uh into victory against the Had the liver of a greek god oh man and then his parties in hollywood were legendary and that was the place to be errol flynn was was the guy uh when he was uh, at his peak in hollywood um but in late 1942 and this is this is kind of interesting so two 17 year old girls betty hansen and peggy satterley separately accused Flynn of statutory rape. Now, statutory rape is it's kind of a misleading term because it's it's sex with a minor. So if, whether they were willing or not, it's still considered statutory rape. Right. Um, 
So no one seems to care about the statutory part. You know? Right. They yeah. always hear the, the, the Yeah, the, yeah, exactly. Now, a trial took place in early 1943, but here's here's kind of an interesting thing, and I learned this as I was doing the research on this. The two separate inc- incidents took place a year apart, or allegedly took place a year apart, but both girls filed their complaints within days of each other. So that leads me to believe, and I don't want to, I don't want to victim shame here, but that's exactly what happened in this trial. But what are the odds that these two separate incidents? these two girls would come together and file complaints days apart. You have to wonder if they were coerced, if they were urged, if they were. I would lean more uh, towards their third, a third party reaching out to both of them rather than those two individual young ladies doing it. Yeah. yeah. Whether or not it was a reporter trying to get the, you know, being able to, I, if you, you, you know, if, somehow they, the reporter got a little information. If we're opening the floor, floor to wild <laughs> accusations, I, I would go with the a studio fixer. You think so? Yeah. Well, if somebody, if, if, if Flynn went wrong on one of the producers or one of the studios. Well, Flynn, wow. Flynn uh, at one point, or I, I, I've read this story. Flynn has been quoted as saying that uh, rival studios may have been behind it. And I do remember reading one story years ago uh, that they were just trying to s- sabotage his career because he was the leading box office draw at that time, and other studios wanted to somehow take him down. So there were accusations saying that rival studios were behind it. Uh, one theory was that uh, L.A. district attorney uh, named Doc Weiler uh, had a vendetta against Warner Brothers because uh, he, when he was running for office, the studio, Warner Brothers, backed his opponent. There you go. And and this was the the district attorney who was behind these charges. So uh, Flynn believed Doc Weiler was vengeful toward not just Warner Brothers, but Hollywood in, gen- in general because of the accused debauchery and everything that was going on in Hollywood and wanted to sort of set up Flynn as a scapegoat and, and show the world. Yeah, you target, uh, you target MGM's biggest hero and say, yeah. look what I did. Yeah, and, and, you know, he represents all of Hollywood with his, yeah. with his you know, behavior. Um, now, interestingly, uh, F- Flynn, I guess for the most part, denied that this has happened, but there are quotes from him not necessarily denying. He he admitted that he did know one of the uh, accusers. I think she might have been an extra in a film that he was in. Um, and so, and again, this is just my interpretation. Maybe these acts did happen. He may or may not have been aware of their age. You know, one quote that he said is that, you know, if, if you're about ready to get busy with someone, you're not going to demand an ID or a birth certificate or call for verification. Like, sometimes you just are in the act of passion, and then all of a sudden you're like, you're, you're right now. <laughs> and so, you know, it's possible he may have been set up from the get-go. Um, he did have a penchant. Andrew, you can help me out here for San Quentin Quail. And Nick, what what that you heard means? The term? <laughs> no. Well, you've heard the term jail bait. <laughs> yes. San Quentin Quail yeah. is a more colorful euphemism. San Quentin is the bait. prison. Yeah, I know that part. It's now, nice. Flynn, uh, you <laughs> Such know, a weird term. <laughs> Flynn Flynn came from you know a part of the world where, and there's you know a large part of the world really looks the other way when it comes to relations with a 17-year-old or a 16-year-old. I mean, there's countries where you can marry, what, as young as 14 or whatever. Sure. So he kind of came to this country kind of having an eye for the young It's illegal in Michigan. So, right. Oh, is it? Is it really? I think there's like parental consent or something. So, So basically, Flynn was accused of something that most of the world and a lot of America didn't they kind of shrugged like is that a crime really like the bottom line is even though he was accused with this nobody really cared no one cared except you know of course for the victims or whatever but um when they went on trial when the the victims didn't go on trial but when they were called to the witness stand their um their values were impugned uh, one of them uh, was accused and I guess proven to have had uh, affairs with married men. Another one, and I'll try not to gasp when I tell you this, but the other accuser had had an abortion. And at the time, abortion was illegal. Oh, yeah. If so, I had some pearls, I'd be clutching them right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the vapors. Um, so these girls had 
And again, I, I hate to be victim blaming, but these are the facts of the case. These girls had questionable reputations, may or may not have set up Errol Flynn. Errol Flynn at the time may or may not have known that he was doing something wrong. It all fell apart. You know, on the, the, witness the problem stand. is you can make a credible argument either way, that Flynn was being railroaded or that the system was just against two young girls. They could say, you know what, how do you know that you maybe maybe you asked for it? Yeah, exactly. I, and, they, and these are young girls going, oh, my God, everybody's against me. My own family thinks I'm a woman of less val- moral values. You know, my name is being spread out there. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. And, you know, and it still happens today. And, and you try right. not to be too quick with the victim blaming, but. Like I said, you know, like Errol said, do you ask for ID? How do you avoid that situation? For any of um, our spring breakers who are listening, first of all, kudos to, to our audience. <laughs> we actually have spring breakers. But imagine getting blackout drunk and then waking up next to someone. You go to, you know, Cancun or someone, you get blackout drunk, and Flynn could get pretty wasted. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is here's an interesting footnote. So during the entire trial where he was showing up at City Hall every day, there was an 18-year-old redhead named Nora Eddington who worked the snack counter at City Hall. Uh, she became Flint's second wife. <laughs> I think that's hilarious. Could you, as, as a lawyer, you could be like, funny. Errol, you got to help me out, man. <laughs> so imagine he's going on trial for statutory rape, and he's walking past this young 18-year-old in the snack shop going, hey. <laughs> How you doing? No shame. And no shame yeah. at all. You know, he invites so, his lawyer to the wedding. He's like, oh, and, and who will your... <laughs> you seem familiar. I met her in the courthouse. One second, Errol, can I talk to you real quick? <laughs> the snack girl at the courthouse, the city hall. Are you kidding me, man? Hence the expression, in like Flint. Yeah. This guy can get away with anything. Now, unfortunately, you know, following the trial, his hard partying ways, alcohol consumption... Uh, really took a toll on him. They said that uh, upon his death, he had the liver of like an 80-year-old man, uh, when in reality, he was only 50 when he died of a massive heart attack. But they said that his his liver was in such advanced stage of yeah. damage that he probably, if he didn't have the heart attack, he would have been dead in six months, nine months anyway. So he lived a fun life, a hard life, um, got away with lots and lots of stuff. And like a shining star, it burned out too soon. I wonder if someone gave him like one of those genie things. Like, I'll give you 50 years of the most debauchery. You live balls out, whatever you want to do. Or 85 years of, you know, garden variety, nine to five life. Yeah. What do you want to do? I don't know. Yeah. 50 years of whatever I want to do, as long as I want to do. Yep. Deal with the devil, man. All right, I, I got one more story before we go around the table. Uh, I was debating whether or not to include this because it's 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 pretty tragic, but it, it falls kind of in line with this topic and what we're talking about today. Right. And, uh, again, I never had heard of this guy until fairly recently, and the only reason I heard about him is because his story is told in books like, uh, oh, what's the uh, Hollywood Babylon, I think it's called, is a book about the, the sordid underbelly of Hollywood and everything. Sure. And a lot of stories in Hollywood Babylon, the book, uh, may or may not be exaggerated or may or may not even be true, but this is one of the stories that's been included in this book. And, again, most people today may not know the name of Ramon Navarro uh, if it wasn't for the uh, scandal at the end of his life that uh, ended up costing him his life. Uh, Ramon Navarro was born in 1899, uh, began acting in silent films in 1917. He was a top box office attraction through the 20s and 30s. Again, I'm shocked that I had never heard of him as a young person growing up. Uh, he ended up filling the void left by the uh, early death of Rudy Valentino. So he kind of filled that void as the Latin lover that would cause women to swoon. Gotcha. And is uh, pretty much considered the first uh, Latin American uh, Hollywood star. Uh, he was the first Latino to be a major Hollywood star. In Hollywood. So the Antonio Banderas of the 1920s. All right. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Uh, now here's, here's where things kind of get sad. Uh, Despite having a Roman Catholic upbringing, he was conflicted by the feelings of homosexuality that he had. And so he turned to alcohol and stuff, uh, dealing with that conflicting nature. Uh, He had relationships with several men and had a uh, kind of a reputation for hiring male prostitutes from an agency that would send 
these uh, escorts to his home. Well, one of these escorts had given uh, Ramon's phone number to uh, a a pair of brothers, uh, Paul and Tom Ferguson, who were 22 and 17 years old. Uh, They had gotten his phone number from a previous client because they had heard that uh, Navarro had kept $5,000 in cash somewhere in his home. The origin of that rumor was that he had spent $5,000 to renovate the interior of his home, but somehow they took that as that he had kept $5,000 in cash in his home. And so on the morning of uh, Halloween 1968, uh, Navarro's personal secretary, Edward Weber, arrived at 3110 Laurel Canyon, used his key to let himself in through the kitchen, When he walked into the living room, he found overturned furniture, broken glasses. Everything was just sort of a mess mess, like someone had searched it. Uh, He went into the master bedroom, which was dark. He pulled open the drapes and saw uh, Navarro's nude body on the bed, badly beaten. So he made several phone calls, including the police. Now, keep in mind, this is 1968. Um, So... These brothers, when they had heard about the $5,000 in cash, they called Navarro and said, hey, we're with this agency. We can uh, have a fun night. So Navarro invited him over. According to prosecutors, uh, the brothers beat and tortured Navarro for several hours trying to get him to reveal where the money was, the non-existent money was. Uh, They ended up leaving with $20 they found in a bathrobe pocket. Uh, they somehow they were able to be traced by authorities. They were arrested and were sentenced to lengthy prison terms, but were paroled just a few years later. Which, man, the brutal, violent death yeah. of a, a former Hollywood movie star, and you only serve a few years for that. Um, but that was not a wake up call for these brothers. They have been rearrested multiple times for other crimes, and served longer sentences for other crimes than the murder of this former Hollywood star. How many times How many times did they go to prison? At least a handful of times? Well, um, a, a couple of times each. Now, um, Tom Ferguson, who later in life admitted that he uh, was responsible for the death of Navarro, committed suicide. His brother, Paul Ferguson, died in prison during a 60-year sentence for rape. So think about that. Uh, the sentence for rape was far more serious than the murder of this person, which hmm. makes makes my head hurt. I'm a little confused by that, but uh, you know, and you know exactly what that is, Joe. That stinks to high heaven. Yeah, I mean, not not to make light of rape. Right. It's a terrible, terrible thing. But why did? And here's the thing no, that no, bugs the me: the sentence for rape is fine. That's sixty, but I'm yeah, talking yeah, about yeah. the murder part. Yeah, and and you have to think that had they spent their lives in prison for the murder, this rape thing would have never happened. Right. Why were they let out? These Violent people were like, okay, you're paroled, and then they go out and hurt more people. But they, they're they're working for someone. That's our. That's I'm just full of conspiracy. I, I must have uh, drank some something. Because <laughs> now everything sounds like, oh my god, I could see it. Yeah. So Paul Ferguson died during that 60 year prison sentence. Uh, Navarro was uh, 69 years old, uh, buried in Calvary Cemetery in East LA, and he has a star on the Walk of Fame. So, um, what a tragic, tortured life. I mean. You know, here he was, a huge leading man in the 20s and 30s uh, that hid this dark, dark secret that um, ended up costing him his life. And uh, sad, sad story. I, I don't know if that's something you can turn into a movie because it would just be excruciating. Yeah. You, where's Where's the joy? Where's the happiness? It's it's a I mean, tragic. The, the heartthrob moment, maybe, maybe. Yeah, you'd have to take, you'd have to do the whole Hollywood. I have to take some liberties with the story. Otherwise, it's yeah. It's just depressing from beginning to end. Yeah. That's kind of like, you know, a couple episodes ago we were talking about uh, uh, femme fatales, and I was talking about the story of uh, Frances Farmer. And there was a movie that was made about her life and career uh, starring um, uh, the, uh, what's her name? The girl who was in uh, King Kong 1978. uh, Jessica Lange. Lange, yeah. yeah. And the movie was brutal because it was just tragic incident after incident after incident and committed to you know, uh, mental institutions and, and shock therapy. And I'm like, I can't do this to myself. Like there has to be, where's the happy Hollywood ending. But unfortunately for a lot of Hollywood stars in real life, there was no happy no. Hollywood ending, man. It was just tragic. So, all right. So those are my three major contributions to our sex scandals, uh, episode. 
Imagine those people. What did you bring to the table today? Well, nothing is, is I mean, on that level. But I'll, <laughs> I, I will say this. I struggled with this topic because there was a lot to choose from. I think before we went on air, I was talking about Girl 27, but there's a documentary on that, and I want to explore more on that. So I ended up picking the story of uh, Loretta Young and Clark Gable. Huh. And we're, since we're talking about sex scandals in Hollywood, that came across as one of you know one of the top ones that are mentioned out there. So Loretta Young was one of the top actresses at the time. Beautiful, yeah. yeah. And she did a movie with uh, Clark Gable in 1935 called uh, A Call of the Wild. The what? The Call of uh, the Wild? Call of the Wild, yeah. okay. And so during the during that that film, uh, they were snowed in, and the chemistry between Loretta Young and Clark Gable, who was about maybe a dozen years her senior, she was twenty two. I think he was thirty four at the time. Uh, so he's you know the dashing leading man. I'm surprised him and Errol Flynn didn't have like it wouldn't surprise me if they were like the original like you see a bunch of handsome guys going on like <laughs> you hear their parties. But Clark Gable was a charmer. Everyone knew it. He was married at the time, and so him and Loretta Young had an affair. And from that, she got pregnant. But she hmm. couldn't announce it because, as you were talking about when it came to abortions, the studios back then controlled the actresses, actors and actresses, but especially the actresses. And so she was concerned that they would say, well, you're just going to have an abortion because we can't lose you for nine months and we can't have you getting you know, big and not fitting, so this is not going to work here under contract, so this is what's going to happen. And so she grew up Catholic, and she was a Catholic. So her mom and her sisters devised a plan as to how she could hide the pregnancy. Hmm. So after she did her, her job, her film, she went to Europe, and she was there. She hid out. She's saying, oh, I'm you know, taking a vacation from acting. And then she had the child. She gave it up for adoption, and then she ended up adopting her own kid when the kid was uh, 19 months old. So the yeah. kid spent some time going back and forth between orphanages, but they always kept track of her. Her name was Judy. And so Loretta Young ends up adopting her own child. And they kind of talk about this in a movie called Hail Caesar. Yeah. You kind of see when oh, Scar yeah. Scarlett Johansson's character has to do that. That's <coughs> right. All right. And so they kind of they kind of call, call back to that because that was the tale of Lo Loretta Young. And so Judy, uh, um, her name's not Judy Lewis, but at the time when she was, you know, Judy Young, she didn't know anything. But people said that. You know, Clark Gable has the ears. You know, if you talk about physical features, you're like, oh, my God. Judy looked a lot like her mom and dad. They were like, hey, you know, people were like, hey, where's she? You know, where's Loretta? Where's Loretta? She's this you know, big actress. And how could she just be gone? Yeah. Is there something going on? She did that movie. I mean, look at the on-screen chemistry between her and Clark Gable. It's almost it's almost like Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt and Mr. and Mrs. Smith. You're like, are they two doing something? Yeah. And they were. Yeah. So in this, So something like that. So when she was, when the kid was born, when Judy was born, she had to wear a bonnet because you had to hide the ears. Because people were like, "Oh, those are Clark Gable's ears. <laughs> you have to be. If you're not Clark Gable's kid, I mean, she's not, right? <laughs> really? Yeah. I mean, so wow. her mom, her mom would put a bonnet over her, 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 her wow. daughter's ears. So when she would go out in public, it wasn't until she was 15 that she actually met Clark Gable. Clark Gable came wow. over to the house, and she said, "Oh, there's you know Clark Gable's in my house, and you know I just talked to him for a little bit. He was here to visit my mom, and at the end." You know, he said, how are you? Are you happy? And then he gave me a kiss on my forehead before he left, and I never really saw him after that. Wow. And then when she was 31, she found out the truth that Clark Gable was her dad, but Clark Gable had already passed by then. Oh. Uh, hmm. So she, Man. you know, now she reflects on it, at, uh, but Loretta Young had to hide it because it would have been a scandal, yeah. she, and she didn't want to lose Judy because, again, Catholic upbringing. So like I said, her mom and her sisters helped her. Devise mm. this plan to adopt your own kid. I wonder if uh, Clark Gable uh, supported her financially, like secretly. Did you Maybe, hear anything about that? But it may, there, there was there was some talk about that because he kind of knew, and also because then there was a sat, another detail that I didn't realize until I found out, did some digging later on. And this came from Loretta Young when she wanted to do her autobiography, and she confided with the biographer that don't release this. I mean, release the book after I die. Because I don't want this to be when I'm alive because I can't really talk to my daughter about it. Because hmm. we've already had to cross several bridges and making peace with this and that. Turns out when, she, you know, so she died, I think, in like in the 2000s, or like close to 2000. So the concept of date rape came about. And she's like, what is date rape? 
And then when she, when Loretta Young found out what date rape was, she was like, oh my God, that was my interaction with Clark Gable. Ooh. Because even so though. So it wasn't necessarily consensual? Because she never she wanted saying? to have a sexual relationship with them. Mm. You know, they, they were flirtatious. They might have been, but she said, I never had any, because he was married at the time. Mm. Clark Gable was mar- married at the time. So she didn't want to be just another conquest for him. But then when she said, okay, and, you know, her daughter was talking about, oh, yeah, I'm doing, you know, watch this thing. I'm on date rape. She's like, what's date rape? Hmm. Oh, that's when, you know, you kind of go and then you wake up and say, you've already had someone had sex with you when you were passed out or hmm. you weren't really aware because you were either drugged or you both drank or you know, someone slipped you a drink or you both just got really drunk and you passed out first and then you can't offer consent. Wow. And she goes, yeah, that, that was me. But the reason I couldn't say anything was because if I'm pregnant, I'm not, my Catholic upbringing said I'm not going to lose the kid. Yeah, yeah, you can't. So when that part came out, so... That's why Judy Lewis was like, oh, my God, you know, now when I see the memoir, my mom's telling me that she didn't want to have any relations with Clark Gable at the time. Hmm. It's interesting because you know, I love Hail Caesar. It's just a yeah. fun movie. And, and, you know, I remember that story with Scarlett Johansson's character, and I never even thought that it was based on anything uh, in real life. But yeah, sure I, sounds like it may have been either. modeled after that. I mean, when you all the stuff that you're talking about, like, closet homosexuality, everything mm-hmm. they kind of touch upon that in that movie. Yeah. You know, when they We're talk about some of the characters. Yeah, yeah, and you yeah. talk about the, you know, hunting for communists and how they kind of have to, like, oh, who did they or weren't they communists? And Fixers, Eddie Mannix, and the tabloids being involved with, like, Tilda Swinton. So they kind of, like, cherry pick a bunch of little things that was happening in old school Hollywood. But, yeah, Jonah Hill, Jonah Hill's character with Scarlett Johansson. Yeah. That yeah, was, yeah. And so she, she, wow. She made sure that she didn't lose her child in the system. Like, oh, yeah, we lost your kid. They made sure that they tracked her. Yeah. So when she was 19 months old, she was adopted by her biological her own mother. mother. Interesting. Just so, because, uh, I mean, and the fact that you know, when you were talking about abortion, the, how much, and Andrew, how much power she, she must have felt and the horror stories she must have heard from other actresses that maybe not name actresses that might have happened to where they said, yeah, don't get knocked up because you're not going to keep it. Yeah. Oh, I can imagine. She's Catholic. She's like, oh, no. I mean, I don't care how this happened. I'm keeping the kid. And then she has to go to her mom and sister's like, you got to help me. Yeah. And you know what's interesting about that is a lot of those Hollywood studio executives are probably conservative. And on the surface, they're anti-abortion. But then as soon as one of their stars get knocked up, guess what? We're going to send you away, maybe for a little retreat. And then you're going to come back and everything's going to be fine. And it's so, so hypocritical. Classic Republican. Okay, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, look, we, we can get the emails and things, but I'm just saying, look, if you want to see what happens to both parties, but I can say that sounds like a classic Republican. It does, yeah. The hypo- hypocrisy. The social it. hypocrisy. Yeah. Like, I'm anti-abortion. I'm anti-gay marriage. Wait, what? <laughs> Isn't that your boyfriend? <laughs> <laughs> no. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like, well, we're kind of getting off topic a little bit, but it no, seems but like yeah. conservatives who scream the loudest about homosexuality or fidelity are the ones that but it was, usually it goes back to end that up mo- on the news. Yeah, and it goes back to that moral code that you were talking about that even Hayes had in there. There was a lot of pressure. So it, it and that, so, and you know, and you think Clark Gable, he's the charmer. And then when you hear this kind of stuff, you go, oh, come on, man. Yeah. And you start hearing these stories like, oh, not you too. But now yeah. you got me. I don't think I've ever seen Call of the Wild, and now you got me uh, wanting to look up that movie to see what kind of chemistry they I saw a few clips, have. and I saw a few clips yeah. on YouTube. I didn't watch the whole movie, but the clips that they focused on, I was like, okay, yeah, I can see it. Yeah. I mean, you kind of like, you know, preset the well for me because I'm supposed to see chemistry. Yeah. But so maybe, you know, but I could see it. I mean. Yeah. Kind of like uh, uh, Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn. Yes. Uh, their chemistry on screen, and they did at least six or eight or more movies together, their chemistry on screen was undeniable, and both were in marriages, but everybody knew below that surface and kind of kept hush-hush, they had something going. I mean, let me put it this way. If the perf- performance is really good, it wouldn't surprise people at the time. Hey, did you know that Spencer and... <laughs> no, really? you got to be... It's like the same thing. Brad Pitt and Angela Jolie. You don't say. <laughs> really? So, ah, that's great. You educated me today. Does that, that surprise you? That yeah, you taught me something new? <laughs> that almost <laughs> never. I'm pinching myself for anyone that's not looking. Mark this, this date in the calendar. Because Joe's usually the one educated. I'm like, oh, learn something new today. Learn another thing. And he's like, Joe's like, I think yeah. you might have taught me something. I'm like, really? That's great. Yeah. Let's scratch one for Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Chunk hard case. You got anything? Hard that, case. That, you know, up. that we're just hard, butchering these. All things. right. So it's Chunk. Quote, hard case, Dalton. <laughs> that's, 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 that, check my IMDb page. 
I just thought you were going like a Goonies reference. <laughs> Charlie. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, so I'm going to go to one of the earliest Hollywood stars. Uh, we're talking early Hollywood, uh, like we always do on this podcast. So, so I'm going to go with Charlie Chaplin. Uh, his second marriage uh, ended in scandal when his wife at the time, uh, her name was Lita Gray, she got pregnant at, uh, I believe it was, oh, yeah, she was 16 and he was 35. Ooh, oh, so, boy. Ooh. <laughs> and, and Charlie Chaplin had a, I mean, you learned about him. He had a reputation of of going after underage women. It, he, it didn't matter how old he got. He he, he just always really. Liked San Quentin Quail. Quail. Yeah, oh. we're gonna revive that term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna yeah. bring that term back. So yeah, yeah, I feel like we're just taking sledgehammers to like a lot of like happy times. Like you're not even yeah, yeah. like Clark Gable gone, Errol Flynn well, gone. Well, like yeah. like Charlie like Chaplin. like we say, I think with a lot of this stuff, you, you try to separate the art from, from yes, the human. Artists. That's true. I mean, that's that that's the reality of humanity. But anyway, I still enjoy Lethal Weapon. <laughs> Yeah, or the music of Jerry Lee Lewis, who yeah. uh, married oh. his teenage cousin. Hey, uh, thanks, Joe. <laughs> but it's Rob. great music, man. No, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Just I was trying to bury it. Yeah. So, um, so she got pregnant, and um, at the time, it, it, uh, I think we talked about it earlier. He could have been charged for statutory rape under California law. So he arranged for a shotgun wedding down in Mexico to avoid. Any press or anything. Um, so uh, they, it just didn't work out. He he he's not that he was not the type of guy to to be tied down to one woman really. And uh, so they got divorced and um and it made the headlines at the time, of course, and it blew up. But he, of course, Charlie Chaplin, he still kept making films for right. a long time. Yeah. Another interesting thing that I would that ties into Charlie Chaplin that we talked about before is that J. Edgar Hoover had a file on him for suspected communism. Of course he yeah. even told uh, the British secret service M one five that, Hey, whenever he comes to the UK, uh, keep an eye out. Of him. MI5 Anything... was alerted to. Yeah. J. Edgar Hoover told his, whoever was head of M M M I five at the time. Mm. Did Hoover have a case? Did have a file on Jesus too? I mean, what's it, you know? It's he it's had funny a case on that. anybody who he personally oh my came God. an interest in. It. it was yeah. That uh, the guy that I was talking about earlier, Ramon Navarro, he was accused of being a communist because he attended the screening of a film that was directed by a communist filmmaker. He made the list sure. because he attended one screening of a film directed by a communist friend of his. Of course. Yes. Good God! Yeah, who 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 was the snitch or who was the plant in the audience that that found this out? You know, how, right, exactly. how, how did how yeah, did how does that become how did that be, how did that become a, a thing with the FBI? Well, I mean, <laughs> when, when anytime you say snitch, my default answer is Ronald Reagan, but it's yeah. before his time, so I can't I can't that, that you know, I got to be fair to Reagan. Yeah, it can't be him. I mean, it wasn't now, right. Ch Chaplin, <laughs> because of all of the accusations and legal troubles, when he I think when he went back to England, he was denied uh, a return yeah. trip to ba U.S. Based on the FBI. Yes, yeah. the, the accusations and all that Jagger stuff. Jagger Hoover personally intervening and saying, no, don't let him in. He, they, yeah. he had that arbitrary power. Yeah, and and now this is this might be urban legend, but one story that I had heard is that at one time, Chaplin had his handprints and footprints at Grauman's Chinese Theater, and after these communist ac accusations flew they removed it with a crowbar and supposedly put it in storage and now they're lost to time now people oh, dispute wow. that story but it sounds like something that would have happened but you can still see chaplin's handprints and footprints uh, at his own studio the chaplin studio which later became the, the muppet studio and stuff like that so okay. he does have handprints and footprints somewhere in hollywood but okay. the story goes that because of these accusations that his handprints and footprints were removed from grauman's chinese theater wow that's right my heart yeah but, yeah <laughs> I, ever since we started this podcast i've been diagnosed with rhs rabbit hole syndrome <laughs> <laughs> i know i know so many threads to go down yeah so did uh, did so? What's the the final story yeah. on Chaplin? Did uh, did you said she got pregnant? Did she give birth? Did uh, 
Um, Did the chaplain me, uh, have that an offspring from that relationship? Um, if not, <laughs> we'll have to do our own research. Yeah, I, I think get that far with with um if he had a kid with her or, or a subsequent woman. Um, but wait, with the sixteen year old, yeah, lady. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, that's yeah, what I'm wondering. Like, yeah. what happened? What became of the okay, pregnancy? Okay, okay. So yeah, I I completely glossed over it. Charles Spencer Chaplin the third was the kid. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I wow. didn't include and, no, and, no. and I, I should include a date, nineteen twenty five. Yeah. This happened. And then they had another kid the next year. Oh wow. And then that's when it it started to deteriorate. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I I glossed over the kid. No, I mean right. look, I mean it's Charlie. It's an it's, it's an important detail. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's Charlie. Amazing. Wow. Well, we got yeah. about uh, how about ten minutes left in the podcast. I, I wanted to throw something out real quick. Um, if you're interested in this sort of thing, there was a series on Netflix in 2020 called Hollywood. A friend of mine who knows um, I love the history of Hollywood recommended it to me. Uh, I found it. I sat down. It's a seven part series, and I watched the first series and thought maybe this is not for me. And my buddy said, no, 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 I'm, I'm ahead of you in this series. I urge you to s- stick with it and watch it. And I'm glad I did. I enjoyed it as it went along. But the whole thing, for the most part, revolves around this Hollywood Babylon sex scandal uh, uh, thing that uh, was happening in Hollywood at the, in, in wartime uh, period of, of Hollywood's history. Um, the series was created by Ian Brennan and Ryan Murphy. And uh, here's something I just learned today, as a matter of fact. The star, or one of the stars who played uh, a fictional actor named Jack Costello, uh, the actor who played him is named David Cornsweet, C-O-R-E-N-S-W-E-T. And he's one of the three finalists to replace Henry Cavill as Superman. Yeah, yeah. So I, that's interesting. Huh. And he looks like a young Henry Cavill. He's yeah, I'm good. dead ringer. I'm good buddies with uh, Corn Sweat, yeah. <laughs> Uh, what's yeah. what's what's my middle name? <laughs> Knucklehead. <laughs> oh jeez. So um so here's basically the story of the the Hollywood series. It's it's um it's about a character. He's he's a fictional character named Ernie West, played by Dylan McDermott, but he's based on a real life person named Scotty Bowers, who uh, when he came to Hollywood, uh, kind of you know sold himself uh, for sexual favors. Then he persuaded his Marine buddies to service the Hollywood stars, producers, and directors. And what they did is they worked out of a gas station in Hollywood. And when clients would come to the gas station, they would sort of drop a secret code word. And then they would have one of these uh, escorts uh, jump in the car and drive off with the likes of, and these are all real, real people, Cole Porter, director George Cukor, uh, Anthony Perkins, Malcolm Forbes. Uh, the list goes on and on, but they would come to this gas station to hook up with escorts. And uh, the Scotty Bowers did not deny it. As a matter of fact, he lived a long life, wrote a memoir in 2012 that ended up becoming the basis of this uh, Hollywood series on Netflix. And then in 2017, there's a documentary that uh, I need to watch about the whole thing. And he lived to the ripe old age of 96, passing away in the fall of 2019. So the the story kind of revolves around this gas station. This actor, this fictional actor, Jack Costello, comes to Hollywood uh, after serving overseas in World War II, wants to become an actor, and finds out to that to get ahead in this town, you have to do whatever is necessary. And he's like, I don't know if this is for me um and so that's how this series starts off and you can imagine yeah when i see that i'm like yeah i don't know if this is for me but it, it did get better and better and another real life character who was portrayed in this series by jim parsons of big bang theory fame uh he was a real life agent uh from the 30s through the 60s who discovered uh actors uh, that we now know as rock hudson tab hunter Troy Donahue and Rory Calhoun. That's why you're trying to come up with the nickname yeah. for Andrew over Chunk here. Chunk Dalton. <laughs> so he would come up with these, these you know, uh, 
larger than life names. And many of these actors, and this this is not to impugn on Andrew here, but many of these actors were closeted gay individuals who he would right. mold and shape into Hollywood hunks that women would swoon over. And in real life, he this uh, character, Henry Wilson, was betting these stars and promising to further their careers. And um, he, he would keep blackmail material in case someone wanted to out... Brock Hudson, who we all know was gay and died of AIDS later in life, if if someone threatened to out Rock Hudson, he would produce blackmail material or offer a scoop on a different actor of lesser caliber to protect Rock Hudson's image. And most of us grew up having no inkling that yeah. Rock Hudson was gay. He did all the Doris Day movies and was the perfect Hollywood hunk. Um, but this guy... People do not look back at this Henry Wilson fondly. He manipulated his yeah. stars and made promises that if they did this, we would do that. And he may have even been connected to the mafia. One story that I read said that he may have had two guys killed who uh, were threatening to reveal Rock Hudson's uh, true story. Uh, he's he's caused people to get hurt to protect secrets. And it. <sighs> Unfortunately, in, in, the, in the series, the Hollywood series, um, which has sort of a, a, a Tarantino twist on real life where they started out, the series starts out sort of based in fact in real life, but then it takes these Tarantino twists that depict an ideal Hollywood. What might have happened if uh, African-American actors weren't, you know, uh, discriminated against in Hollywood or like Anna Mae Wong? the Asian actress who was discriminated against. The series kind of creates this fictional movie studio that put these types of actors on the big screen for middle America to embrace and created a world where tolerance and acceptance began in the late 40s. Now, we all know that is not the case. No. That is pure fiction. Um, and unfortunately... The character of this Henry Wilson, they sort of uh, glamorized to, when in reality, he he died in 1978 after a long battle with drugs and alcohol and was pretty much despised by Hollywood. Um, on the series, they sort of lifted him up on this pedestal, and they end up producing a movie about Peg Entwistle, who we've talked about yeah. on this podcast before, who committed suicide by jumping off the Hollywood sign. And so the series talks about the fictional production of a movie about Peg Entwistle and even changes her outcome in the movie within the series. Oh, okay. So they portray Hollywood with this, you know, Hollywood happy ending when in real life it was pretty sorted and dark and uh yeah, and so part of uh part of that legend. So I mean, you think about what we've been covering, you know, talk about this gas station. We talked about it in the previous episode. The plastic surgery that people would get to look like starlets so they could oh yeah that was touched on in la confidential yeah. where kim basinger's character was cut to look like veronica lake yeah. and there's that famous scene where he accuses lana turner of being a lana turner lookalike but and you have to think about yeah. the medical community that has to be brought because you can't go to a, a side eye like cut, cut me up to make me look like <laughs> you know rock hudson like, yeah no man it doesn't work like that yeah you gotta you get a hospital you a lot get... of money changing hands yeah. and under the table and that sort of thing so all right, well, that's pretty much going to wrap up this episode on Hollywood sex scandals. I feel like we only scratched the surface. This might have to be something we revisit down the road. There's too many bit, to pick. So. I mean, we had several that we left off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, we may have to come back to this. That's uh, It's right up our alley, so to speak. So, all right, Maginos Pete, Andrew Walker. Yes. Thanks Thank for Thank you for in. another great episode. Good night, yeah. everybody. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm.